So welcome everybody to our first Science Communication Day at the Institute of Science and Technology, Austria, or ISTA. My name is Tom Hensinger. I'm the president of this institute, and I have the great honor to moderate this event today. Just a few words about the institute for those of you who are here for the first time. ISTA is a very young international institute dedicated to basic research and graduate education in the natural and mathematical sciences. We have currently 70 research groups uh, on campus, and uh, we have a state-of-the-art environment in terms of scientific infrastructure, and we are a growing institution. By 2036, we'll have 150 groups on campus. The mission statement of ISTA defines success, and I quote, as con contributing to the international scientific community, to research in Europe, to higher education in Austria, and to society at large. And especially this, large, this last part, contributing to society at large, is of special importance to us. Science is not a collection of facts, but a collection of techniques that together constitute the most powerful method for obtaining knowledge. Yet, most real world questions have too many facets to be answered or even approximated by a single technique or a single scientist or a single discipline. These common misunderstandings have far-reaching consequences, which range from a mistrust in scientists to the rejection of science altogether, to a blurring between science and pseudoscience, all the way on the other side to a very uncritical glorification of scientists and their findings. Therefore, a major responsibility of both scientists and science communicators is to explain both the power and also the limitations and limits of scientific techniques, processes, and findings. In the next one and a half hours, we will delve into this topic, informing versus confusing the public, and look into ways how scientists, how research institutions, and how also science journalists and science communicators and science educators can help address this issue. So thank you for joining us today. I'm very pleased to see so many researchers, also journalists and science enthusiasts in the audience, and this confirms how relevant this topic is. I will first invite the Austrian Minister for Education, Science and Research, Martin Polaschek, uh, to give us a few words of introduction. He very much agrees on us, on the message of how important this topic is. Dear guests, and participants of today's Science Communication Day. As you are all well aware, today we are facing numerous crises. The COVID-19 pandemic, growing inflation, not to forget the unpredictable consequences of climate change, as well as an ongoing war in our neighborhood. The increasingly worsening dynamic of this multitude of problems, so it seems, is overwhelming frustrating, and at times just too much to comprehend. I am convinced that science is our best answer to confront most of these challenges. We, as a society, more than ever, depend on the scientific expertise and innovative workforce of researchers. And ISTA is truly a role model when it comes to excellent science and innovation in Austria. I am convinced that scientific progress cannot and must not happen in an isolated ivory tower. I am very grateful that you at ISTA understood the importance of getting in on touch with the public and I am impressed by your numerous initiatives. Finally, yet importantly, I want to use this opportunity to thank all participants of today's Science Communication Day. Your contribution to fighting science skepticism is highly appreciated, and I want to encourage you all not to give up to this cause. You at ISTA set an example of how to do it. I wish you all an inspiring and insightful evening. I will now introduce the panelists. We are very glad and very proud and thankful to have such a prominent panel here today. 
uh, of experts in science communication from various fields and various countries. And I will introduce them in alphabetical order. Elena Books is Professor of Ethics in Medicine and Health Technologies and Director of the Institute of History and Ethics in Medicine at the Technical University of Munich. Professor Books is, is a medical doctor with postgraduate degrees in philosophy and sociology. Her research spans the whole field of biomedical and public health ethics. She has been the chair of the German Ethics Council since 2020. She has also been awarded the German National Prize and the Heinz Meyer Leibniz Medal. Christina Marizzi is a scientist and educator. She's currently director of community science at Biobus. She graduated from the University of Vienna with a PhD in genetics. And since 2015, she has directed a teaching lab and co-developed several citizen science programs around biodiversity in the New York City area for Cold Spring Harbor's DNA Learning Center. She's a PI of the New York City Virus Hunters Program the first large-scale attempt to map viruses in urban wild birds. Her interest in biological systems and data visualization has also led to several collaborations with artists and architects in Vienna, Tel Aviv, London, and New York, designing custom visuals and hands-on activities for their events. Sarah Yeo holds a PhD in communications from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and is Associate Professor in the Department of Communication and Director of the STEM Ambassador Program and a faculty affiliate with the Global Change and Sustainability Center and Environmental Humanities Program at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. Her research includes public opinion on STEM issues, but also humor, emotion, and information seeking and processing. Professor Yeo holds a master's in oceanography from the University of Hawaii, and her training in the sciences has informed her research agenda at the intersections of science, media, and politics. She also co-hosts Planet SciComm, a podcast on science communication. Mariano Thafra has since 2019 led the graphic and storytelling team of El País in Madrid. He has also worked as a graphics reporter on special, for special projects with the Wall Street Journal. And he started and led the infographic and data visualization department of Univision News in Miami. Earlier, he spent uh, uh, more than a decade at two of the most prominent national dailies in Spain, El Mundo and El País. And his work has been recognized with the uh, Cavalli Science Journalism Award of the AAAS of the Ortega y Gasset Journalism Award and of, of the Malofich Infographics Award uh, for the globally known visual article, A Room, a Bar, and a Classroom, How the Coronavirus is Spread Through the Air. Elke Ziegler has worked as a science journalist since 1996, initially as a freelance journalist for the Austrian daily newspaper, The Standard, and the news magazine, Profil. Um, then she worked for the, uh, uh, since then she's worked for, for the ORF, the Austrian um, television and radio, uh, public television and radio pro, uh, program, and she has reported since 2013 on the radio about scientific topics. Since the outbreak of the pandemic in 2020, Elke Ziegler has made numerous live analysis and reports on, to on the topics of corona for radio and online. And for this reporting, she received the Robert Hochner Prize in 2021, one of the most prestigious journalism prizes in Austria, and just recently the, Aust the Austrian State Prize for Science Journalism in 2022. Congratulations. <laughs> She's also now the, actually the head of science reporting of radio and online at the Austrian Broadcasting Corporation. Finally, Carl Zimmer uh, is a columnist for the New York Times and the author of 14 books about science. His books include Life's Edge, The Search for What It Means to Be Alive, and She Has Her Mother's Laugh, The Powers, Perversions, and Potential of Heredity. He's also an adjunct professor in the Department of Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry at Yale University. Thank all of you 
for joining us for this panel discussion. And I would like to start with inviting all of you for your opening statements. Uh, the information deficit model, as it is technically called, assumes that people's lack of knowledge can simply be overcome by providing them with adequate information. However, this model is considered outdated. In our communications department, they say that research has shown that showing people research, which means providing them with information and numbers, doesn't work. So may I ask all of you, uh, uh, what does state-of-the-art science communication look like? Uh, I'll, maybe I'll start in the reverse order. Uh, so Mr. Simmer, can, may I invite you to start? And please keep your statements to two to maximum three minutes. Great, thank you. Thank you all uh, for, for inviting me. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be here. I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, the comments from the other panelists. Um, I suppose um, state of the art uh, for me uh, in terms of science communication is, is understanding um, your audience, um, understanding how to reach them, not necessarily with a piece of paper, um, understanding the, the technology that's going to make them possible. Um, understanding how to communicate about science uh, effectively through that channel. Um, my preference is storytelling, but data visualization can be uh, powerful as well, and there are other, other techniques. Um, and then how to, uh, how to avoid um, your communication being distorted. In other words, through uh, misinformation or disinformation. In other words, um, it, is, it is easy for people to misunderstand what you're trying to tell them, and that's your responsibility as, as a writer or another kind of communicator. And there are also people who have a vested interest in distorting what you're saying um, for their own ends. Um, and so you need to be aware of all of that. Um, it's not just enough to just sort of push some data out and think that it'll take care of itself. It won't. It needs, it needs care. Thank you. Ms. Ziegler? Yeah, I think I can uh, add to this. Um, and I also speak as a journalist, uh, not as a, a science communication expert. So it's a little bit a difference for me to do science communication and to do science journalism. But for science journalism, I think it's um, my main goal to have some sort of a, a fair communication with the audience with um, as less hierarchy as possible. So what do I mean by that? Um, I try to be in dialogue with the audience. Um, for example, I did a corona podcast during the first month of the pandemic and uh, it worked like that, that people sent me their questions, like questions they were really interested in, and I tried to get answers uh, from scientists uh, on these questions and then to bring the answers back to the audience. So I really tried to take up what is interesting for the people outside and then to ask scientists uh, what are the best answers to these questions. Um, so to take people in, to take um, their questions seriously, uh, this is for me a main goal in my work and I think it is, should be state of the art also in science journalism. Um, perhaps this is not, um, we don't do this it always like this, so we uh, we take, uh, we also select topics and we choose them by ourselves, but also by choosing topics, I think the focus should be uh, like, is this something which um, gives the audience some sort of knowledge they can use for their life? Yeah. Is, it, is it something that is constructive to their life? And I think um, this is, uh, or this should be the main goal uh, when we do science journalism. Um, yeah, I, I would leave it like that for now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tafra. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. From my point of view, in avant-garde scientific communication, it is necessary to put the person at the center of communication. I think this is our little secret formula. It's 
explaining first in the headline how the scientific discovery or study affects or benefits you. Once the person feels affected, they will want to expand the, the, the information. And on the other hand, to communicate uh, science effectively, it is very, very important to differentiate between the amount of data and information that is needed to carry out an investigation, which is probably a lot, and the amount of information that is needed to understand it and understand its importance or what or why affect us, which is much less. Um, in journalism, we always uh, source the original papers and scientific investigation, but we use much less information. Thank you. Professor Yu? Oh, hi, it's great May to be here. I echo the sentiments of my fellow panelists and uh, thanking you for this invitation. Sarah is fine. Um, but I, I think, first of all, uh, I, we should point out the irony of using information to convince people that the information deficit model is not the best model for science communication. Um, but in any case, I think what the state of the art science communication might look like is something for me around um, being strategic, right, in your communication. Um, Carl Zimmer mentioned knowing your audience, you do have to know your audience. You also have to have, and I would add that you have to have an objective for that audience that you would like um, to meet, right, an objective to aim toward, and that the strategy or the tactic that you use in order to achieve a particular objective with a specific audience um, can be empirically driven. A lot of these answers can be answered by, uh, or sorry, a lot of these questions can be answered by um, just some research, right, in science communication. And I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Moritz? Yeah, I, I have to say I already agree with everything everybody says. Um, you don't make my life easy here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, no, for my work, I would just say um, absolutely true. Like I, as an educator and researcher at the same time, I always like try to have a dialogue. But the first step, like finding the person that just want to talk about science and because we represent privilege and science or whatever, that's for me the critical part. How do I have a conversation with somebody who doesn't want to be, be approached upon, right? And um, sometimes as we do this, it's like a, through hands-on activities, and it could be artistic. I've been doing like, if you have ever heard about bio art, like painting with the microbes, um, to make these beautiful living and breeding artworks by literally like, you know, slabbing microbes on a plate and let it grow. And it's a, this classic, very low-key artistic, um, activity you can do while people paint with this invisible ink, you can talk to them, wait a minute, do you know actually what the microbe is? And do you think germs are good or bad? And do you have them on your body right now? And then they'll learn, oh my God, they, they, how do they survive? What do they need? And I have them in my body, what do you mean? And what is genetic engineering? So this is the way how I get them in. And you do this over and over and over again. So a single exposure is not enough, but uh, Let's be creative, again, instead of throwing information out on people, we all know it doesn't work. Let's get them hands-on and through a very creative way. So I'm very a huge advocate of emerging art and science, um, but we also have social media projects out there, right, like to actually maybe like also bring great information out there and to um, support citizen science and community science, going out to the community, identify what do they care about, what kind of research question, even if they don't know it, it's a research question, they want to answer and then give them means to either participate in your research or to actually even better do their research by themselves. And you can call this like fun family science afternoon, right? Or fun family food garden afternoon. Um, uh, but they do science and they learn about the scientific process like firsthand. That's my approach and I would leave it like, like that at the moment. Okay, thank you. And Professor Cooks? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me and thanks for the invitation. There's a German saying that uh, goes a bit like uh, the last one is bitten by the dogs. Um, so um, <laughs> my fellow panelists, 
I've already said pretty much everything, you know, science communication must be targeted to different audiences, must be personalized, context specific, get so at people where they are engaging, emotive, affect people while still being truthful, and sort of um, at eye level. Um, so I'm not going to repeat that. I thought I might actually just say why it's actually important that we do this well from an ethical perspective. Um, and it's a really simple argument, but I think it's quite powerful. Um, science, at least in the European context, most of science is a public endeavor. And as a public endeavor, and that's not just sort of that a lot of science is funded publicly, but also the entire infrastructure that leads to science is public. Science is part of society, and as such, as a community, we have a duty to explain what we do and to share with that society what it is that we do. And that doesn't mean every individual researcher has that duty. So I don't want to say that because not everybody wants to do this or is very talented at science communication, but as a whole, we have that responsibility. And vice versa, we're dependent as researchers and as science overall on society and actually people um, understanding what it is that we do and wanting us to do it and supporting it. Because if that doesn't happen, um, and we've already heard some of, some of that, um, there might be growing distrust, um, there might be a reluctance to support some science or all of it, um, and there might be trouble brewing for us as societies because science, truthful science, well-communicated science, is one of the main pillars of a democratic, stable society, and I'm not even talking about innovation and what makes life uh, worth living. So I believe there's a huge ethical case to be made to do or to, to, to engage more than maybe some of us have done in the past in, in good science communication and actually invest in it and take it really seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, a very good point because it connects directly to my, my, my first question, actually, which is a question, you know, I find very interesting. It's about the behavior actually of scientists in the public and, uh, and, uh, and their statements in the public, which I think is rarely really directly addressed as a topic. Uh, I mean, most big problems as today, as I said in the introduction, whether one talks about the pandemic or about climate crisis or, or is, is really complex. It has so many angles that any individual scientist even a whole discipline can share only a very small angle uh, on the issue. Yet often when a scientist, uh, you know, stands in the limelight, gets public exposure, and we've seen a lot of that in the pandemic, right, from mathematicians who explain exponential curves to uh, modelers of a software to virologists to psychologists, each one of them always stresses their own narrow angle on the issue, and as a result, there's, uh, you hear many different angles, and the public starts confusing angles with opinions. Um, so let me ask you, Mr. Zimmer, let me ask you straight on. Should scientists be more humble when, when they're in the... <laughs> well, I mean, it's not really my, my place to, to uh, police the tone of scientists. I mean, I... I interview them to get information to, uh, and whatever they want to say on the record, uh, I, I'm going to use. I will certainly um, not take what they're saying um, as gospel because they're scientists and you know, not religious figures. And so um, if someone makes an assertion, I want to know what the basis is for that. And, um, <clears throat> you know, um, uh, and it, 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 it 
It, and I'm especially uh, wary of that if they're starting to speak beyond their immediate expertise because, you know, I mean, scientists are tr try to keep up with all the science there is, but there's a lot of science out there. And very often, uh, the further you go, a scientist will, you know, will, you know a, a climate scientist may, um, all they know about viruses may be what they read by us you know, in newspapers or in magazines or on the radio. I mean, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that, but I think that science communicators, or at least uh, those of us who are journalists, uh, need to take that into account. How scientists decide to navigate this media world, is, that's, that's a, you know, maybe the scientists can take that, that part of it. Thank you. Me Ms. Sigler, to continue this discussion, so how in your opinion can actual science journalists now properly communicate not only you know, the, the pluses, the power and the consequences of science, but also the proper scope and the limitations of specific results and, and entire you know, scientific approaches? Yeah, I think you have to, to be quite precise when communicating about science and when reporting about science. So. I think what you really have to do is um, to stress uh, what are the results of a research, but also what is not clear and which questions cannot be answered. Um, this is something which is completely clear in science. So in every trust, trustworthy study, there is a section where um, there is written down everything that might be co-founding factors or question questions that can't be answered. But in journalism, this is something very unusual that you do that. And I think this is the special quality of science journalism, to really make this transparent. So you have the knowledge, um, which is for now something which can be communicated, but there are open questions and they have to be investigated further on. Um, and um, yeah, I think um, this is actually the main point. Um, because by this, um, you also avoid that somebody tells you, like in two weeks, well, you told us two weeks ago, uh, this was the result and now it's something different. But this is what science is, you know? It can be in two weeks something different. Um, and this is what the public should understand. And this is where science journalism can make a contribution to this understanding, to my opinion. Thank you. As soon as science communication and journalism actually adheres to, to emotional storytelling, the line between scientific precision and emotional impact gets blurred even more, obviously. And on one hand, one always needs to simplify in order to explain. On the other hand, simplification also plays in the hands of those who wish to paint scientific findings just as an opinion, right? Uh, Mr. Thafra, What's the proper role of storytelling and metaphor in science communication and science journalism? As I said before, the amount of data needed to carry out an investigation is much greater than that needed to communicate it. Since it's no longer necessary to tell everything, only the main thing, we can use the storytelling to find the, that emotional link with the audience. For example, in the article, a room, a bar, and a classroom, uh, how the coronavirus is spread through the air, uh, we did that. The team of scientists who de de developed a model to estimate contagion uh, used hundreds of variables to do so. We did. Uh, we didn't have to give all the data to the audience. Um, we properly linked it to where the original study was, but concentrated on explaining uh, to the audience uh, how the discovery affected them. For example, we used the, uh, a room, a bar, and a class, the, those examples, those scenarios, because they exactly were the, were the places where the most infections were taking place. Uh, specifically in Spain, the, um, the, the health agency of here, from here, um, every, every day it published um, a 
data report with the, all the outbreaks and uh, where in the in, in the restaurants and the, in the social gatherings where the infections were taking place. Then we we use that uh, spaces. We draw a room with guests because we can all imagine ourselves at home having dinner with family and friends. Um, it is a daily scene that generates that, that sorry generates an emotional bond, an emotional link. And but the numbers, the data, and all the things were real. Uh, they came from uh, the original model. Thank you. Professor Books, uh, books maybe <coughs> may I ask you what, what, what's the eth ethical aspect of this, you know, simplification to explain? How much may journalists distort science in order to simplify it to the public? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> it's a complicated question. And I just want to make one observation. Um, um, sort of going back slightly to what Carl Zimmer has been discussing, it's an interesting thing that there are things like codes of ethics or codes of conduct for science journalists, but not for scientists. So there is a beginning of trying to think about what science itself should adhere to. How should we deal with this question of what's an opinion, what's expertise? What are the limits of expertise? And because um, uh, Carl just said he doesn't want to police the scientists he interviews. But as a journalist, you have to adhere to a code of conduct, whereas the scientists, there is not an agreed code of conduct or a, a set of ethics. There, are, there is a beginning of an academic debate here. And so one of the things that would have to be part of such a, um, a a code of ethics or the principles of good science communication, let's call it that way, for scientists themselves is how much may we simplify and how much may be possibly even distort. And the, the simple answer would be we may simplify yet we may not distort. So it's not, it's, an, it's a true art. You can do good science communication simple, in a simple way, hinting at the complexity. A lot of that is about language, about finding a punchy, understandable way of, of sort of selling the, the main message we've heard that uh, from, from several people. But distortion means you change that message. And one of the main ethical duties is to be truthful. And the second is to adhere to the limits or to, to remain within the limits of your expertise. And that was one of the things I think we've seen in the pandemic quite a bit. And I understand why it happened. So I've had myself the experience of sitting in a talk show, which is live, and somebody asks you something. And they don't want to hear, well, I can't answer this question because I'm not the expert on this. That doesn't fly. You will never get invited again. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you, can, you can try and do it well. I can hear, hear, I can only cite other experts. And so you can sort of try and signal that you're reaching the limits of your expertise. But the way media works, at least sort of the TV, live media, it's different in print. Um, that's very difficult. And so there sort of the responsibilities of both the journalists and the scientists have to work together. And that is very difficult because we know that at least in the German speaking world, these talk shows are supposed to be con to some degree contrarian. Um, and they need to have a journalistic setup, pro and con, you know, for and against. And usually, as we know, science is prayer and there is nuance and you might say pro but or you might say no but possibly yes if you know things are complex and that's very hard in TV. I think in print scientists do already really have the duty not to overstretch their expertise and at least say 
look, I might be a virologist, but up until pretty much yesterday, I've never worked on coronaviruses. And that can change half a year later because the virologists will be able to very quickly adapt their knowledge. Or, and um, we've heard that, I might be a statistician, but I should probably not say that much on social impacts of certain measures. I can say something about effectiveness because I can model it, uh, but I cannot say something on social impacts on vulnerable groups, for example. And so I think there is a real necessity that us as scientists and researchers try to be more mindful of the fact that one of the things that is certainly problematic is going beyond our expertise. And we should be... Uh, that's not something that is a failure, right? I think it's actually... Some, you achieve something when you signal I'm retreating here, um, and somebody else needs to say something about it, but it plays against our uh, human vanity and the visibility, and so I think it's an uphill battle. Okay, thank you. By the way, may I invite all of our panelists, if you have a follow-up comment or may just you know, immediately have a reaction, please jump in, don't, don't hesitate. Uh, My next question aims at sort of, you know, uh, what is, you know, uh, the ultimate really uh, thing that science communication and science journalism can achieve at all? Can, can it counter the issues of distrust uh, in society that some, uh, some parts of society have in science and what often goes along with it, increasing popularity of pseudoscience, example, homeopathy? and belief in conspiracy theories, to, to name the extreme? Or is this rather not the problem of science, communication, and, and journalism, at all, and scientists at all, but it may be primarily an educational, you know, social media, even, even legal and ultimately political issue? Professor Yo, what, 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 what do you think? Um. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think what is the what is the sort of goal for me when I think about what is the goal of science communication? I think about encouraging people to um, turn to science when they have questions about behaviors, actions, you know, things that science can answer. Um, and so, I think what is important here, and we've we've talked quite a bit about these sort of one-off, instantaneous, any piece of journalism or or one. Uh, public engagement activity of some sort, but science communication, as all of my fellow panelists know, uh, is difficult, it's challenging, right? And I think for me, one of the things we, I like to think about is, is how one develops long-term relationships, how all the things that we've described here, whether it be education, right, or journalism, or scientists communicating directly with public audiences, or even social media, all of these are um, different ways of building some sort of relationship right, between science and society. And when I think about what is the goal of science communication in general, I think about, well, what I would like is if somebody who is not a scientist, or even me as a social scientist, I don't, I'm not a virologist, I don't know about viruses, I don't know about the coronavirus, but I turn to science when I have a question about that. Right? I turn to trusted sources um, in science about that, and that is kind of what I would hope the outcome of all of the science communication that we do might be. Thank you. Ms. Marizzi, may I ask you, how important is it actually to explain the scientific method itself over and over again, rather than just always the findings? I think it's very important that I do it every day in my work and I do it so cheerfully. <laughs> because there's like no other, I mean, if you're a scientist, and that's why I like, I like the term in English research, because it put like the, the, the search and the read together, you do something, you search for something, then you do it again. And you do it again and you do it again. So I, 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 like, I like to talk about this, like, you know, it's never set in stone, which is the beauty of science, and science should be that way, so you're gonna go and search over and over again to make, like, you know, to make it better. Um, 
I think, and it, this came up before, um, people look for simple answers. It's not that simple. Um, and people need to understand, like, you know, the scientific process is a process. And again, it's designed to be that way. So if you have an understanding, if you did this, like, you know, go away from canned labs and mix A, B, and C together and get an exploding volcano, you don't do this here. I don't know, like, the Austrian curriculum, if you have something exciting about this, <laughs> maybe, like, in the past or soon. Um, but, you know, you need to go away from, like, fixed variables. And you still break this down to very simple engagements in the classroom or, like, you know, for general science engagement activities, right? This is not how science works usually in a laboratory, right? It's more complex, it takes longer, there is frustration there, but there's a pure joy. So I think getting the understanding out there, like, and again, like, this is the friction. What's true today is not true tomorrow because I just presented the latest model, which is backed up by a lot, lot of data, and, you know, and we have the scientific peer review process, which works better or worse sometimes, but it works still, it's still the best system that we have, right? So I present you today a model that actually is um, the latest that I can give you right now. And then, you know, this actually came up from, as a result from the scientific process. So I talk about this a lot. And while I do this, I also like to talk about, like, you can be part of this process, right? And what makes you staying away from science? And is it like because you think you you don't sound intelligent when you don't have the proper vocabulary, right? You might actually have this brilliant idea in your head, but because you, English is a second language or you just like, you know, uh, never had an exposure to science um, in your previous life, you know, you might have a hard time expressing yourself. So it's, it's also like a training for the educators to look beyond that barrier, right? So we actually lose a lot of nuance here. And, goes into a cultural responsive teaching, like, you know, the scientific process might be meaningless for somebody, you know, that actually had never seen a scientist before, but if you can bring those people in, it changes science itself. My, my main um, message is, uh, like, usually science is everywhere, and science is and should be for everyone, and we should really work hard together to make that happen. Thank you. Let's Talk a moment also on the, uh, about the flip side, right? While there's much distrust in science in the public, there's also much, let's say, naive belief in the possibilities of technology, right? There's, uh, there's also, also that segment of the population, and we've seen this the limited degree in the pandemic with, with the corona apps. Uh, we see it a lot uh, uh, in the climate crisis, with, in the expectations about the technological solution or different technological solutions. So, so Professor Books, why is there so little middle ground between technology skeptics and technology believers? Shouldn't the public by now in the 21st century have ample experience with new technologies uh, to realize that every single technology has the potential for both use and misuse. And thus it's not, um, it is a matter of how and not a matter of whether or not uh, to adapt innovation, right? Ooh, that's such a good question because I find it absolutely mind boggling that sometimes you have both in the same person, right? You can have anti-vaxxers who completely oppose anything to do with vaccine technology, who are absolutely the earliest, most enthusiastic adopters of other technologies, of course, um, also built on science. So you sometimes have these, um, these conflicts even in one person, uh, but you certainly, of course, have the um, sort of the classic case is what, 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 what you see in society. Um, and I... I don't think we can say, look, you should know at this point. It's true, the dual use problem that you just mentioned is one that we've had probably since the first person took up a rock um, and made it into something that you could, I don't know, um, shape um, a, a tree with to make something for yourself, but you could also bash somebody ha somebody's head in, right? So this is intrinsic to science and technology development. 
uh, and we know, you know, that the major, major example is, of course, um, our ability to tinker with atoms, um, the biggest dual-use um, question we've, we've, we've ever discussed, probably. But I don't think it, it, it will help us to say, guys, you should really know this at this point. Um, I think that science skepticism, and here I must say I'm not an expert. There are others here on the panel who know this better, so I'll be brief. Certainly has elements that are not, that you can't access with logical arguments and with information and look, uh, we've had these examples in the past, um, shouldn't you get over it? Um, but that goes to things that are more grounded in belief systems, in psychological factors. And again, I'm reporting excellent work, Ingrid Brodny, for example, an Austrian uh, researcher who works on, on, um, on all these topics. Um, she, she continues to emphasize that you have to actually get people in their personal situation. And the best way to get at somebody who's a true skeptic is probably not from somewhere, us as scientists. We, we may try and we have to try to do all these campaigns and make good information available, easily available, and everything we've said, yes, targeted, low threshold, blah, blah, blah. But it's also actually a, a responsibility of all of us as citizens, as people, to try and, and get those who are sort of going down the rabbit hole, to get them back. Because very often it's personal factors, it's interpersonal factors and psychological factors and a whole host of other things that are really difficult to achieve through sort of very traditional channels of communication. And if I may just say one final sentence, one of the things is that we should probably try and get at the sources because this distrust is being pushed at people very much. Um, for political reasons, um, for um, their financial gain, and it's on all, on many, many of the platforms that many of us use constantly, but there are some who are really bad. TikTok, Telegram is worse than Twitter, and Twitter can be pretty bad, right? So I do also think we need to think about responsibilities, and I'm being very tentative here, about the responsibilities how platforms can govern these sort of fountains of misinformation better and whether we as societies might have to go down the regulatory and legal route of trying to at least get at sort of the sources of this science skepticism. Because when once individuals are already down that rabbit hole, it's super, super difficult to get them back. Thank you. Mr. Thafra, maybe I can ask you if you see a difference here between different countries of you know how the public um, sees science and technology. And here I mean, you know, different, we can talk about different Western countries, but also about is there a sort of a different difference between Western uh, democracies and say, say uh, countries in Asia? Uh, or is it the same everywhere? Are there simply fundamental human characteristics at work here? I think the human fundamental human characteristics. There is, for me, there are no difference between countries in that. What I'm going to say maybe it's a little obvious probably, but I think everyone agree that no magical solution will, will appear when we have a real problem. Especially when we have a health problem, everyone agree that we, we have to participate in the recovery with rehabilitation and the science can help us that we have to, to do something. I think that especially now that we are all aware that we have um, to participate to change in the change to stop the war problems. For example, 
reduce now gas consumption, consumption now that, uh, that, that, that there may be restric restrictions. For me, te uh, technology and science can provide the solution, such as solar panels or uh, electric cars, but the responsibility of using them well lies with uh, each person. I think uh, this is our duty to show how small behaviors can suppose uh, big changes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would just like to add that um, I also see this individual uh, level, but um, I would like to um, underline something that Professor Brooks also said. I think it's really also a question of the framework we have. The one thing are the platforms uh, who have a special role in emphasizing like some attitudes, um, theories, etc. Um, the other thing are political forces. We can see this in Europe, I think, very clearly that we have in countries like Austria, where uh, we have political parties who engage in a very uh, science skeptical way. Um, this is part of their strategy. I mean, it's, I, I really think that not all of the persons who, um, who, who emphasize this in public are really convinced that it is like this, but it's part of the strategy how they want to be successful. And I think um, this is also, um, like one main driver of this development we see in Austria of this science skepticism, which is really strong and it is um, part of the political game to um, try to, um, well, to, to, to have some success on this basis. Um, and one thing I would like to add also is um, that I think that we as journalists and also as scientists, we really have to be open for people who have questions. Um, because in, in, during the last two and a half years, I got a lot of questions from the audience um, co concerning especially Corona, and I really tried to answer them because I always thought it's so important that people ask because when they are over this point when they don't ask anymore, I think then we lost them, and it's really hard to get them back. And it's really a task of scientists and journalists to be open for these questions and really to get in a dialogue and to engage in a dialogue, even if it costs a lot of time. Very good point. Very good point. So maybe it is a good opportunity to actually invite all of you to maybe share a personal story because I suspect it happens to all of us, even, even, even the best science journalists that you, uh, you, know, you may have at one point or another you know, un unknowingly shared or spread some incorrect information or invited a scientist or who, who, you know, who talked more about their opinions than, than about facts. Uh, so when communicating science, uh, who do actually journalists trust and how should you how do you, do you and how should you interview scientists? I notice at least in Austrian TV say, you know, scientists are treated totally different than politicians in interviews. Yeah, they are. And I think it's also, it's also correct to do this. <laughs> um, but what, I mean, what is my main point in, in my work? When I um, select a scientist for an interview, I really try to focus on the work the scientist does and think about it if this is uh, the topic which is close to my questions. You know, uh, if this is really a person who works on a daily basis on a topic I want to know something about. I would not ask a political scientist about, um, I don't know, um, about the coronavirus and how it spreads in a room, for example. Yeah? And I would not ask a virologist um, uh, what he thinks about uh, whether vaccinations should be mandatory or not. Perhaps a political scientist can say more about the discussion about mandatory vaccinations. Um, so um, I really try to select interview partners very precisely, and this can be very challenging when you work for daily news because you are under sometimes a very high time pressure and uh, you really have to find people quickly. And there are scientists who are happy to be in the media and say um, something to almost every question. Uh, but th this is also what Professor Books before said, um, 
which is um, like the task of journalists to be precise when selecting interview partners and to be precise when interviewing. Um, I think this is actually the main, the main task um, so that you don't um, get messages on air which are more opinions than facts. I want to jump in here a little bit mm. just from the scientist perspective and because you, I think you just mentioned something important. I did not realize the news cycle, how fast it is, right? Mm -hmm. I, I literally had no idea, which means when, when we are, we are all busy people, the scientists, like, you know, and then you hear, oh my God, I also have to do science outreach, what do you mean, right? It can feel like a burden, but again, if there is an institutional decision, like, you know, every person should do the best they can to do science outreach, it could mean you can fact check an infographic that our press department is putting together. It takes you a minute. Please help us out. Please, like, you know, if you're a journalist, you contact me. I don't have to go on TV every single time. You might not be the person, like, you know, that you want anyway, but I, I can literally tell you this article you send me in two minutes is something you want to investigate further, right? Which would take you maybe like an hour or two hours, right? So build those relationships with your press department or with the journalists, like, you know, they're going to be very grateful to have people like you in, in their life. And again, it helps you to, um, if you have to pitch a story and if you want to train your science communication skills, you have somebody you can just, like, train yourself in. So I think, I think that's important to, to understand. Like, it's not always you have to go out and educate everybody. They're introverts in this world as well, like I am. So you can just like, do something which is more meaningful for you, which for some people it's a tutorial in your newspaper. But please, please, please get back to science, like to science journalists in a, maybe, couple of two hours, like it's usually a good time, or as soon as you can. And if you don't, also say, hey, I don't have time right now. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I would like to underline that and just add um, that for us as journalists, it's really, really helpful to have people we can call when we are not sure about a topic, for example. This hasn't got to be an interview and it has not, so it really can be a background talk, um, just how, how do you see this paper? Is this really something we should uh, like um, dig in and uh, find more about it, and so on? Or is this something you would say this is um, yeah, it's not so interesting um, in a scientific context? And I'm really really grateful that I have many people I can call and just um, ask, could you have a look at that uh, and tell me what you think about it? It helps me really in my orientation in my daily work. And if I could jump in here really quickly. I think this highlights kind of the relationship in science communication between research and practice, or in general, right, between research and practice. What um, is happening here is um, the scenarios that are described is, is some relationship between practitioners, communicators, journalists, and the scientists themselves, right? And I think those are exceedingly important um, and we don't quite have enough of those and I think what is also highlighted um, in previous remarks is that these partnerships these relationships don't have to be around large projects they can be these short background conversations that take you know a few minutes of your time um, but that it is important to, to establish those relationships Mr. Zimmer or Mr. Thrust Safra, has, have you ever, you know, found yourself in a situation where you actually spread in public misinformation, have been abused by, and discovered only later? Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not thinking of one, but uh, that may be more of my faulty memory than. Uh, <laughs> than, than my uh, stellar track record. Um, you know, certainly, um, there are uh, venues where that can be very easy. Um, so, you know, it's, I think when you're working on an article, like, there are more opportunities for you to carefully catch yourself, to sort of ask yourself, wait a minute, is th what this person is saying doesn't actually make sense. So let me push back at them. Let me talk to someone else. So you have those opportunities. Um, but, you know, the communication landscape has changed dramatically over the years. And so, you know, um, many journalists are on Twitter. And you can get very carried away. And you see a very, you know, a, a, a tweet from someone who, who seems uh, reliable. And it seems very shocking. 
maybe they use all capital letters in their tweet to get rid of your attention, and you get so kind of swept up that you're tempted to just hit retweet or to make a comment like, oh my gosh, like this, this might be important. Um, that, I think, is a bad idea usually, and, and um, you know, I, I, I'm still on Twitter, but I definitely, like, hold my, I check myself, you know, I, I if I'm going to tweet something, I, I wait like 30 seconds, and if the, if, if that's sometimes is enough time to just realize, oh, that would be stupid for me to do that. So, um, so you know, as these new uh, uh, channels arise, there are, there are new dangers to them. Mr. Thafra, I mean, you. Uh, yeah, I think I have a, a, a good example during the pandemic. Uh, at the beginning, we were told that the, the, this virus was transmitted by, uh, by, by big, uh, <laughs> not through the air. And uh, the, the, we have to fight against the virus with clean our hands and with all measures that uh, soon the scientists uh, told us that no, 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 this is a respiratory virus, but uh, we were protecting us with cleaning our hands and with surgical masks. During the pandemic, we are we have been using surgical masks when the doctors and the scientists uh, are telling us that uh, those are not for a respiratory virus. And from the beginning to the end, uh, the journalists, uh, we have been constantly trying to explain why and how, and, but the it's very difficult to stop the misinformation from the once the information is there in Twitter, in social media, uh, and now we can say that we are uh, in the end of the pandemic, and those errors from the beginning uh, still remain there, and it's very, very, very difficult to to stop that. Very difficult. Um, I think it's our work not to, to fight against that, but uh, fight against that is you have to prove <laughs> that you are right and the scientific are right. But uh, no one uh, has to prove that something is, 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 is not. Thank, thank you. I need to watch a little bit at time, and I want to actually shift topic a little bit now to research institutions, and in particular, uh, this institute here. We have, you know, many scientists on campus who actually want to do outreach, want to do science uh, communication, but in, in, in the daily life of a scientist with deadlines, grant proposals, and so on, it's often viewed as just an additional chore. So maybe, Professor, yo you know, how, how can ISTA or any research institution for that matter encourage and support scientists to engage in science communication? Yeah, thank you for that question. That's a really great question. Um, I think, you know, I mentioned earlier science communication is difficult. And for any individual scientist, it is an additional challenge because they're not, we're not trained in public engagement and public outreach. Um, and so training is important, right? I think. Uh, programs like the one I direct, the STEM ambassador program that trains scientists to build relationships with communities and kind of thinking about how to build trusting relationships with communities that you are connected with based on who you are as a whole person, not just as a scientist is important, right? And especially we think in particular about hard to reach audiences, audiences that maybe don't always have access to science. And so training is one aspect of that. We can't expect anyone to do something that is out of their realm of expertise without some training and some support. So that's something that's important. I think the other thing, um, 
that is important is to have professionals in this space, right? Professional science communicators, people like public information officers, for example, who are helping scientists talk about their science to public audiences. Um, and I know we've been talking about simplification, but I actually um, want to push back a little bit on that because I don't think that it is simplification of science. I think it is isolating the core of a message which is something that's very challenging for us as scientists. But there is a core message in there. There's a lot of caveats around it that have to do with the study itself. But, you know, most of us don't need to know that, right? I don't need to know the caveats of, of how the vaccine was created, for example, or how vaccines are created, right? There is a core message there that a scientist can isolate. And so training is one aspect of supporting scientists, having staff, Right, having people who support that and are trained in science communication um, is another aspect of this that I think sort of research institutions and other educational institutions um, can, can implement. Can I jump in on one additional aspect here? Because I think one of the things that is important that um, science institutions do is to, to change the metric a little bit. So it used to be the fact that you had to actually hide your science communication. I remember, I'm, I mean, I'm aging myself here, but when I was applying for professorships, I had already um, many experiences in media engagement and also in policy advisory and all that kind of outreach stuff, right, um, from England. And I didn't put that in my CVs, because invariably it was something that was sort of seen as this, what the hell is she doing? Where are the impact factors? Where are the research grants? I had the impact factors. I had the research grant. So I put them there, but I didn't put in all this other stuff. And I think that's, there's a conversation to be had. And I think it's happening right now with the big funding organizations that we, if we want scientists to engage in this, and if we truly want to support this endeavor, and I wholeheartedly think we should, as I've said, that something's got to give in that area as well. And the UK has the Research Excellence Framework Program, the REF, and I know there's a lot of criticism about that as well, but what that has done, I'm just mentioning it as, a, as an example of a different metric, it has really pushed people to highlight the way they might engage, so with communities, for example, or they might do other kinds of public outreach or science communication. And I'm not saying we do the ref, but I think we need to have conversations of how that how scientists can be incentivized in 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 tokens that are actually helpful and valuable for their career. Sorry to be so blunt. But if, if, if that doesn't happen, the best won't do it, or the most ambitious will always think, well, you know, this is the but small stuff. I mean, this is, you actually took up my next point, and to me, uh, this is to me personally a struggle with this point a lot, actually, as, you know, uh, as an institution who keeps hiring scientists, because sometimes wonder whether the, I think you experience I don't think is so much the reality today. Maybe the pendulum is even swinging too much the other direction, I'm a bit afraid, right? Because brilliant scientists are not necessarily good communicators, and yet employers today, and especially also funders, increasingly demand from them and even you know, consider public communication to be part of their job. Yet you would never you know, ask you know, if, if you're a patient in the hospital, having heart surgery done, you are not going to ask for the communication credentials of the heart surgeon, right? <laughs> uh, so is it actually right to put this obligation almost on scientists? But can I just correct that I didn't say that's a different thing. The obligation is different from having a metric that sort of rewards people who do it well. So I just wanted to, to make that okay. clear because I agree with you. To some, to a lot. I, I understand, and I, I, you know, overstate things, but it it does swing a bit in this direction. That part of every grant application now is, is there's an outreach part, and so uh, does anybody else have an? Uh, but you, I, I would just add. I mean, 
if a, if a scientist said, oh, I just do science, you want me to give lectures for students as well? No, that's, I'm not, I don't do that, I'm just a scientist. Uh, um, you want me to actually write grants to do my science? You want me to put sentences together? No, I'm just a scientist. I, I think that, I think that um, there's a false and romantic idea that scientists are somehow just pure data gatherers and thinkers, and that's just not, that's never been true. So, I mean, I think that, I, I, I don't, you know, it, it will be a matter to decide whether scientists uh, ought to add these kinds of communication things to their, to their duties, but, I mean, they already are. That is already part of their job. It's just, you know, you may want to decide, well, in, 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 in addition to a lecture, maybe I should learn how to, um, you know, write some, you know, a column in a newspaper that other people can understand who don't have a PhD in my particular subject. That's a skill, and, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not something that happens automatically. I mean, I think some scientists feel like, well, if they can't sit down and naturally just write a book or an essay or something, then they'll never be able to do it. And any writer will tell you that's not how it works. You know, it just takes it takes practice. It's like saying I I can't hear if someone gives me a trombone and I can't play it on the first day. Like, does that mean I'll never be able to play a trombone? Well, maybe in my case, yes. But you know, <laughs> people do learn how to play trombone. They don't just start playing. Them. Yeah, and I, I would add too that we're t we're we're not saying that everyone need every scientist has to communicate science or be engaged in public outreach, right? Um, there's diversity even within groups, I think, and there's there's nuance within groups that we should recognize. But among a lot of scientists who do get the training and experience that type of public engagement or public communication, a lot also many also report that this is very rewarding part of their work and that often kind of keeps them going in their science and in their jobs. Yeah, thank you. Maybe can I sort of uh, get towards the end by asking the Austrians here uh, on the panel a bit about ISTA, uh, especially the role of ISTA in, in the Austrian science landscape. Because this is also a question we often get. I mean, should the institute and maybe should the institute here actively be more active in attempting to become more visible, also in the public in Austria, or will it simply our science speak for itself at some point? Well, I think um, I think you got already more visible during the last years. Yeah. I mean, this is my observation because um, I think. Um, you have, you have one problem at the Institute, which is you're doing basic science. <laughs> and um, this is all, always a little bit complicated to communicate, uh, for example, in media, because you cannot, normally you don't have the big results you can communicate, you're more communicating a process. And um, news are always about results. So uh, this is perhaps a problem you have at ISTA, but um, <coughs> nevertheless, the topics are very interesting and I think you got more visible during the last years. And one point which I thought about today is I think you have such interesting students and researchers here. I mean, from all over the world with very interesting stories. And for example, today I had in my daily news show, which is called uh, Wissen Aktuell, a portrait of a young uh, researcher from Ukraine who works here at ISTA. Huh? And um, and I thought, and last week uh, about a young man from Afghanistan. So um, I think this is perhaps something you could communicate more offensively, that you really are here some sort of a pool of very interesting people from all over the world. Right. <laughs> Thank you. So, Ms. Mreti, you are, you are abroad. Are we possibly even known better abroad than at home? That's a tricky question. Um, before I answer your question, I want to get back to like, you know, this is, it's, it's um, basic science. I know it's hard to communicate, but you know, sometimes you have these amazing results, like, you know, it, it sounds like the most boring thing in the world to look into like the basic defense mechanism of bacteria, and then all of a sudden you have CRISPR, right? 
<laughs> the CRISPR system. You know, and exactly, I know. <laughs> and this is the thing, like, you know, so I do understand the tension here. So how do we find the angle? That's so why I think, like, you know, mm. finding your core message and then you're still, like, you know, making a connection is super important. And thanks for mm. helping this. But Ista, so I'm, I'm a fan of basic research. Um, I gonna, um, this just as close, I'm a plant geneticist. And I have been looking at Ista very closely. When I finished my degree, it was like, well, you were just attracting like really fantastic plant geneticists to your institute. So you have been on my radar, like, you know, just to, to apply. Um, it still happened to go abroad though, but I would say, um, especially in the plant genetics world, like, you know, from my side, like very fantastic groups. So I think you do have a reputation in the United States as well. And um, yeah, you're a very young institute. So that's another challenge you have, like, you know, how, what, what, what does branding do? Like, you know, you, you seem to have like, you know, sustainable funding to like, you know, attract and maintain talent. So you seem to do a lot of things right. Okay, thank you. I'll thank you. leave this as a last word and I'll thank all of the panelists. I really enjoyed this panel. Let's give them a big hand. And, and to you in the audience, also thank you, all of you, for joining us today in person. And I hope you had an informative and interesting evening. And I hope to see you soon at another occasion here at ISTA. And everyone here is welcome to join us also now outside of the lecture hall for a reception. And I hope the two of you at least can, can join us a bit for, for, for more discussion. Uh, have a good evening and thank you. Thank you.